Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, this is um, a project that I've started recently to interview top performing salespeople uh, to, so that we can uh, present for you or hear or, we, or you can hear for yourselves the uh, um, the techniques and practices and skills that top performers use in order to achieve consistent results rather than hearing it from old soldiers like me. So um, I, I'm going to introduce you now uh, to Kerry Duffy. Um, and I'd, I'd like to ask Kerry to just briefly summarize his career to date and some of the high points before we get into the questions. Kerry, could you uh, um, share for the audience? Thanks, Clive. Hi, everyone. Um, yes, I am Kerry Duffy. I've worked in sales since I left school 17. Um, and I originally worked in paper and print in the suburbs of North London. And I, from probably the late 90s, was moved into technology. So I've worked in technology sales for, for very, many, very many years now. Um, I think it's all well over 20, 25 years of experience. And now I work for a, a UK IT services provider um, and I've worked for them for 15 years and I work in the enterprise team. So my core focus is selling into uh, the enterprise space uh, organizations, pretty much UK centric, but over like 250, 300 million and upwards uh, selling a range of different services to those uh, those types of organizations and uh, yeah be delighted to to see if i can help with anything today and maybe um, help anyone who's looking at developing themselves in this area thanks kerry that's perfect so uh, let's get straight into the questions um perhaps you could tell our viewers and me uh, something about the habits and practices that you consider to have the most impact uh, on your sales success Okay, it's a good question. I think um, I, I read somewhere recently that discipline equals freedom, uh, and I'm a strong believer of that um, in terms of the discipline that's required um, in quite an, an emotional, turbulent uh, role that we've got as salespeople to have the discipline to do the right things at the right time. Um, and that really starts with how one conducts themselves in terms of making sure that they're looking after themselves to be in the best shape ready to to be successful in their job from that be a mental and physical perspective as well but generally i think sales has got a lot to do with planning understanding the right activities and measuring success in order to kind of determine what uh, brings the best outcome um and i think some of those habits might be if speaking to other people i know who've been very successful they have a plan which they work to and a strategy that they work to which has core fundamentals in terms of, uh, to give an example, it might be the importance that they place on prospecting. Whatever stage of the career they're at, they're always looking to, to build their pipeline, which the pipe is life, right? So it's the most important thing to keep focus on. You're still trying to create that top of funnel pipeline and trying to work and leverage your internal network or people within your organization in order to see, keep creating that pipeline of opportunities you might be able to work on. So I think if you, if you undermine what you're doing or underline what you're doing with just core principles of what you do as a salesperson with that perhaps being the most important one of that constantly looking for that next opportunity and where you can create value for people in or outside of your network i would say that the long you know people who've got longevity in sales still continue to hold that principle very close to the to the core of what they do does that make sense absolutely that makes a lot of sense and i love that sound bite the pipe is life yeah, that, well, it, it really is. It, it, it really is, isn't it? Because ultimately, um, you know, we there's winners and losers in every single engagement, and there's no way that you can guarantee whether you're in. You're never in full control of a of a customer's buying process or a customer's decision, because you know, it's because it's ultimately up to them. It's, you know, it's free will and all that. So you need to have a varied kind of diversified type of opportunity. not what you sell if you sell a service or if you sell a product it's quite different perhaps but you just need to have a lot of different long-term large small those different ones that you know will kind of flow through their old sales cycles or buying cycles as we should really say um at different rates so yeah the pipes everything it's like that's what i look at if i've not if you've not built pipeline recently you're already stagnating you're withering on the vine or one is so it's always important that you keep trying to refresh that top of pipeline what sort of pipeline ratio do you try to maintain? I'd like, it's 
good, good question. Three times is kind of like what you would say. So you'd like to be three, three times of your annual quota, your number. So if I've got a one million pound quota, it, it, I'm rolling. Some people I've spoken to prefer five. It really depends on the type of, you know, where you are in your sales career and what you're selling. Because obviously, you know, you could be in a, some sort of sweet spot. You have the ability to sell very large solutions, which ultimately could, you know, crush your quota within two or three orders. So it's very, very difficult to be very scientific about that. I'd love to say five. Five would be wonderful, wouldn't it? But then the, 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 the paradox of that, it would be very difficult to service five times your pipeline, moving these different kind of deals through the stages yeah. when they kind of come in and come out, unless you've got a team of people working for you, which would be, which would be great. And they were just managing your opportunities with you. But quite often it's very difficult, of course, to determine which of one of those is going to give you the best chance of the successful outcome. So quite often you have to overcompensate and spin more plates in order to kind of give yourself the best chance of it being one in four or whatever that might be. If I knew if I knew the answer to which of the ones to go for, then you know, I'd either I don't know, you wouldn't I, I wouldn't be available to speak because I wouldn't be doing it anymore, I, I should imagine. Well, you must have a way of deciding, you know, filtering out. So how do you decide if something's an opportunity? Because, I mean, the pipeline of three to one would suggest that oh, you're going to convert one in every three on, a, on it's average. A, it's, a, it's, a really, it's a really great question. Really great question. And what, one thing I've also done, which just comes back to your previous question, is I've done consistently now, probably for the last three or four years, whereas before I was always a student of sales, but I just learned on the job and I would do my training and whatever. I think the proliferation now of, um, sales um, insights that are available to just anyone who's you know got the internet it's just incredible from the amount of sales books books now which really talk about the modern seller and the modern buyer which are available to on audible the kind of courses that you can attend the videos that you can watch YouTube is stacked full of very very good thought leaders in sales helping people through the development process of their own careers etc etc so I really think now that there's there's a lot of tools and methodologies in terms of um, uh, qualification processes that you can take on, and ultimately, different ones work for different people. You know, you've got people like Scotsman or people like Ban or all these are kind of other ones that can use. But I feel like when you do a lot of reading and research, and it becomes more than just your day job in terms of really wanting to kind of immerse yourself in sales. What you tend to do is, or what I tend to do anyway, is take a little bit of all of these qualification methods and they become kind of my own way that I look yeah. at an opportunity and the more that I've done this over the years the more it's become more intangible it's kind of like a, a gut feel that I think is something there are a key few key drivers in terms of in discovery I think you can find out a lot about an opportunity how well your discovery goes in any engagement with a new prospective client or someone you know, who doesn't even, who's not even approaching a bottom window, but someone you might, a business lady, you might have the opportunity to speak with. I think in discovery, you can really uncover whether there is something here that you can pursue or whether there's a demonstrable chance that you can provide a great outcome. For this. Can you add value to this person and their organization? Yeah, okay, well, that's kind of like my benchmark. Can I see something there that's tangible? An interesting thing that you say, as you move down into the opportunities and you've got all your opportunities logged on your CRM, when you look at those opportunities, really it's a case of understanding from the customer whether there's, you know, uh, whether there's a perceived pain or a, a goal. If, if you're moving away from pain or you're moving towards a goal for which the rewards are understood and they've been quantified, then I think those two things you can kind of look to match towards. I think most people do move away from pain. I think that's probably the greatest compelling event for any major purchase, certainly in technology. But often there are obviously organizations who need to catch up, who need to get somewhere, perhaps they've got their own agenda to, to, to meet, and they're moving towards, moving towards pleasure or a, or a desired future state. So really you've got two ends of it. You've got pain and you've got a future state of positivity, which is very different to their current environment. But when you start to understand if you, during your discovery, if people have done business cases, is there a business case that's already been kind of approved by the board? Has there been some sort of analysis on what the cost of inaction might be, you know, maintaining the status quo? What would happen if you were still in your, your, your current position 
caught a later. There's a myriad of kind of questions that you can ask to actually dig under the the, the what's a, you have to be a detective in sales, right? What's what's written and stated as to, and then what the real reality is of the situation yeah. that you're facing. Because many times, kind of over the years, um, I've gone into a situation and believed what I've seen in terms of okay, there's an RFP for a major kind of technology outsource. Gone six months through, burnt many cycles, and realised that actually the biggest the biggest obstacle in this is not another vendor winning or not another service provider, but it's just failure to launch. It's no decision, you know. And the older I've got, the more I've been able to kind of get an idea of when I think actually these people have the appetite, willingness, and desire to really make those fundamental changes, which means it's worth my while trying to help them for the next six or twelve months. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, so many um, uh, out of any ten sales. <laughs> I often say four or five of them never going to happen. Nothing Absolutely. happens. They don't buy anything. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think, you know, it's great to, when, in order to do that, you only really get there by experience. And, and I think, or learning from people with experience who take a, you know, not, not necessarily a negative view. I'm always looking for the no's rather than the yeses. I think that's a good way of looking at it, right? You find your no's, you can clear that time out. There's nothing greater than getting time back when you think you've got something, right? You go, oh, Okay, I've decided that's not, I know now that's not really a worthwhile use of my time to pursue. So you're like, oh, great. It's, it's almost sec it's the second best feeling to win is like, is like no bidding something in my experience, you know, because you know you're not going to waste your time on something that's not going to go. A no is as good as a yes. Oh, brilliant. Just keep looking for the no's. You'll be fine, really, yeah. if you look at it that way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there things that you do every day? Yes, there are. Um, a plan, and a little bit the night before, planning and constantly changing the way that you plan your day and the way that you best organise your key priorities for the day. I mean, I've got, you know, I've got a jotter, I've used online stuff, I've used notes on my phone. But the thing that I try to do every day is I write a list and maybe it's a list I've got from yesterday. And at the top of that list, I've got, is this essential? And that's the kind of thing I try to remind myself whenever I go through any of these tasks. Is this task that I'm doing now essential from a perspective of, okay, I have to help a customer, so it's like it's non-negotiable. But is it absolutely fundamental to me reaching the objectives which I've got, which it ultimately rolls up to meeting my quota and, and making sure that I perform to, to what I've been set. So I try to look at that list every day. And what I'll try to do is obviously, you know, eat the frog first. I'm sure you're familiar, familiar with that. So do the ugliest, horriblest task as the first thing you kind of look at. Um, and that saves a lot on procrastination, which, you know, I can be as guilty as the next person is in terms of putting off some of those really challenging, annoying, non-profit making kind of things that you've got to do. But fundamentally, you need to get those done. So once you've got those kind of large stones in, and you can start to fit all of the other smaller stuff around it. Um, so really prioritization of three main tasks in a day. Um, I've read a lot of stuff and like people say that, you know, if you've got more than three main tasks in your day, then you, you're doing something wrong. Um, and I know everyone works in different sales environments and sells different kinds of products and services. But really, once you get to a level of focus on one particular, they call it monotasking, right? Once you do you, have you heard of the Pomodoro technique where you kind of set an alarm for yes, I have, a few yeah. minutes? Yeah, you know that, right? So just do that. Just drill down, drill down, drill down, monotask. Ignore all of the dopamine potential hits of like your teams coming up or your phone going off or an email. <laughs> coming in. If you could do as I say, not do as I do, right? But I'm just, you know, that, that that's kind of the ideal scenario that you would just be able to focus on one task at a time, giving it your full attention. And then breaking after 20 minutes, taking a, taking a break, refreshing your brain and going back into it. So, yeah, I think prioritization of the task and a realization of like, is this essential? So you never get away from those because once you start working to other people's agendas and reacting to stuff as it kind of comes in and hits your kind of inbox or your Teams or your other messaging or your Slack messenger, then you've kind of lost control over that. And ultimately, it's about being good at saying no to a lot of stuff, which I find really hard, but saying no is really great in terms of trying to make sure that you do what's really important for you. Yeah. Yeah, it's what you don't do that makes the difference. It's what you choose not to do that makes the difference. 100%. 100%. Yeah, that's excellent. Okay. 
Um, what mistakes have you learned to avoid in your sales career? Um, I think one that might be slightly different to maybe what you're expecting. I think I really have invested everything emotionally and personally into the the outcome of stuff that's not not really in my control. So what I think I've done on many times is you know in, in many large opportunities that perhaps I've worked on, I've really felt that I needed, and I've what well, I've invested the outcome of that. I've, I've invested my own kind of almost self esteem and and you know in in the outcome of something that I can never really have full control over so and that's happened many times over my career and you know the also the ones that you've won as well the, the point is like if I if I win this thing and I'm successful then I'm you know I'm good and I'm amazing I'm a good person and if I don't win this then oh my god I'm the pits I'm you know I'm terrible I'm I'm the scum of the earth so where I've done where I've done that many times is I think I've invested too much in the outcomes of stuff that I haven't got the control into and it's affected me really badly, you know, outside of work, in my family life. So I try not, I try to be dispassionate now about the outcomes, whilst always trying to be professional and do everything I can to where I feel I can help the customer, do everything I can to try and put the best case forward, but accept the fact that it's not within my control in the end and be able to move on. So win with, you know, win with style and lose with style in terms of, a balance in both sides right you're not you're not amazing just because you won because you probably had 15 people helping you in the same way you're also not terrible if you lose something if you can learn from your mistakes if that makes sense yeah absolutely there, there's uh there is always learning in failure i mean for, there's no fail forward tom Pinterest wasn't it who said fail forward faster yeah yeah the, 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 sometimes it's the, the the worst part is when you just don't really understand the tangible reasons for that outcome and sometimes you can understand them, but they might not compute because what you have is obviously you're seeing it. And so you're not necessarily doing the right thing, which is putting yourself in your buyer's shoes. You can only see the outcome and the decision based on your own. You suddenly jump back into your own shoes. It's like, well, I've given you all this, but the perspective from the other side of the table is six different people all and weighing all of this up. I do this kind of thing all the time. They may only do it two at once every two or three years. So it's, it's very difficult to keep grounded and, and have some distance from what you're doing whilst always making sure that you're doing absolutely everything you can in your power to give yourself the best chance of winning. But yeah, when you do learn, uh, that's a great thing. Uh, you can always learn. You can always pass that on. I said to some people, I had a, you know, not a reputation, but I'd, I'd been very successful in my career. And, you know, some people come and ask me about some, you know, some problems that I had. And I was like, I've lost every deal possible. I've lost it every way. I've lost it by making mistakes in presentations, making mistakes in commercials. I've made it every single way. And I make less mistakes now, I still make mistakes now, like plenty of them. But you make less mistakes because you can't pursue, you can't always be perfect or one will never learn. Unless there's, you know, that salesperson who's always perfect is great, well done, I'll never meet them, obviously. I mean, it's like there's, there's always, always a learning there. That's why sometimes you get to sales when you, have had many years of experience because you've just you've lived through all those kind of experiences which have shaped you to be what you are in the moment when you're when you're putting forward the case that you're the best person to work with you know yeah 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 it's it, but it's all about as you said it's all about learning from your failures oh, and there's always something to be gained even from the things that don't work out i think and i think you know, no, i agree that's really yeah um Tell me about um, the knowledge that you have that supports your success in your current role and how you came by it. Can you just repeat that, the, that question just one more time for me, please. Yeah, yeah, sure. right. it's, it's about the knowledge. Because I mean, so I, I was writing about this on LinkedIn this morning, uh, about, sorry, not this morning, preparing for tomorrow's post, probably. Uh, comparing doctors with salespeople. Um, yeah, so this was a post two days ago now. I'll get it right in a minute. Um, and um, so what are the admiral qualities of doctors that salespeople should copy? And uh, one thing that's obvious is their um, really huge knowledge, right? That they spend a decade gaining. And, and in sales, I think that's very important too, although we, we usually don't get a decade to learn it. 
Uh, and so the question is about what's the knowledge you have that sustains you in your current role in, in, the, in the job that you're in and how did you come by it? Really good question. I think this comes up, I got on a, um, one of my mentors put me onto like a path of personal development probably about five or six years ago. And I started reading your traditional kind of texts around things that would help you, richest man in Babylon, et cetera, et cetera. Some, some of these kind of entry level kind of uh, stuff that you would read that takes you on that path towards kind of, and I've gone right the way through that process and still doing it now. So I, I read a book a month non-fiction um and i'll try to read fiction as well but normally a non-fiction book in something to do with either personal development or sales a month and that's an audible so you know you've got headphones plenty of time to be walking around with that if you can whether it be on your commute or, or walking anywhere or around the house as my wife likes to tell me to take them off so i've got them on. I'm listening to what's, stuff like that. What's, the best, what's the best book you've read this year or listened to this year um i it's a really good question i am re, what, sales wise sales wise um there was one uh called inked by jeb blount who's an american yeah, uh, uh i was kind of leader that was really good as well um I say that one was really impressive in fact i just get my up as well at the moment um outside of that i've read some really interesting pieces i'm reading one called sales secrets of the top two percent by Brandon Branchin, and that's like 15 hours. It's a bit of a, it's a bit of a grind, but basically he interviews a lot of salespeople in much the same way as you do, and they tell him right. what the secrets are. You can pick up a little bit from that. Um, what else am I reading? I'm also reading uh, The Unknown Methods of Critical Thinking, which is by Dale Owen, which is really good as well. So that one kind of blends personal development into just decision-making in sales as well. Um, so and the, the last I'm sorry, critical, the, uh, I'm, I'm just trying to write it down. Uh, yeah, sorry. It was the unknown methods of critical thinking. And by? Uh, by Dale Owen. Dale Owen. Brilliant. Okay. Yeah. And then the other one, just as a, as a, which I've been meaning to read for ages, was Man's Search for Meaning by Victor Frankl, oh, which is not an yeah. sales. Um, but that's, uh, he's a psychiatrist who, so who's a concentration camp survivor, which again is just incredible kind of. I, and that talks about psychology as well as his, his experiences and that reading stuff like that does give you some context of when you think, you know, how lucky we are to not be in those situations, but, but how lucky we are in being in a job like sales where you've got the ability to improve your life and stuff like that. S stuff like that really helps kind of give balance, if that makes sense. But I've, I've got about a book, I've got a reading list of about 40 I could share with you. <laughs> Me too. I, I read I read the Victor Frankl book of years, decades and decades ago, maybe forty years ago. Yeah. And, uh, to, for me, um, how do you find the will to carry on when you're in such a, you know, if you, if you read about the conditions that they had to experience, uh, that they had to, what well, they had to deal with each day, the question in my mind is, how do you survive that? And I think that's what the book's about. Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, he's applied that. There's a logotherapy is his own, you know, his own school of psycho psychoanalysis. The interesting thing I found about that book was he, after a while, because he, because he's, you know, being a doctor, uh, not a, you know, medical doctor, but in the end, he had to do a lot of that work. What he ended up doing was he was moving around quite a lot, and where, whereas before he would try and avoid the fate, he would be like, well, don't go into that working bad feeling about it. In the end, he left all of it open to fate and so he stopped trying to be in because he was no longer in control of fate does as she pleases right so but you just have to kind of throw it out there to the universe and he was lucky enough that he just kind of got through it and survived whereas many other people did when they tried to take control and go try to avoid that or do this he just was like well it is kind of what it is you know where i am and i just need to kind of just you know just make the best of what i can do right yeah. um the other thing is well, I've got quite into, which you might be interested in, is uh, Stoic philosophy. I don't know if you heard of the Stoics. Yeah, yeah, the Stoics. Yeah. 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 Marcus Stoics, Aurelius. Yeah. So this is Memento Mori, which is, again, not supposed to be um, uh, in any way morbid. It's basically meditating on death, and that's what allows you to live a good life rather than being fixated by death in the end, more like, what can I do today? Because the sands of time are moving, you know, it's not to think about. 
you know, you've got to just kind of see what you can. I think having that type of attitude in sales is not a bad thing as well. Not not being focused on the outcomes, just seeing if you can kind of help people. Obviously, you've got to do what you've got to do. But in the way of having that attitude of like just trying to make it the best that you can do and putting the best into it, even the ones that you can't help, you know, trying to help people who are not within your sphere of kind of influence or control and your network thing that we haven't really touched on cultivating a personal network is so so important it's kind of led us to talk together as well right so yeah i could ramble on all day about this stuff sorry <laughs> no worries no, it's really valuable i think it's very valuable anyway um and and so the, the question um I, what about your technical knowledge that was what i was trying to you know so what is the, the knowledge you have about it or, or technology or software um uh, that you use in order to um diagnose and propose solutions you know good very good question now a really high valued salesperson is someone who who can do pretty much everything you know has a business acumen that means with the right experience they may be able to work technically with certain subject matter experts but have a grasp of the technology field that they're operating in and the technology that their clients use that's number one um, as well as that, to, to gain that, then you need to be doing studying and you need to be keeping up to date and trying with accreditations, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's, I think that's really key. I think where it comes into um, being a salesperson as well, you need to have the ability to run legal contracts as well. You need to be able to leverage business relationships, stakeholders, you need to talk business language in order to kind of, to kind of be able to be fully rounded to have that business conversation. Because ultimately, you know, the procurement of technology is just a transaction. What's the best fit of technology? It's really matching a business, sorry, matching a technology to the objectives of an organization and what they want to achieve when they want to re deliver a return on investment on this as well. And so I'm not, to, I'm not trying to say that the, the technical is not important because it's very important and I'm mildly technical and I have a grasp of those concepts and I understand cloud and I understand cyber and I understand networks and all those different kind of parts. Where I think is where I think a salesperson's required these days is having the, the feet in both camps, the technical and the knowledge and the understanding of how that technology could positively impact a, a, an organization or an individual you're talking to, but the business acumen to be able to bridge the gap between the two. Um, no one buys and sells, well, People maybe sell on features and benefits, but it's all about that translation that middle kind of part where you're pulling the technology out of it and the deliverables and matching them to a business and helping someone visualize the business case. You know, sometimes what I like to try and do is like, see what are the afters? This is where we now are now. What you're trying to create is the, you, with technology as the major underpinning factor, but this is what your business is going to look like six months after we've worked together. And that's a completely different and it, and that's and again that's a really interesting way of qualification because if it's a very similar environment to what you're currently looking at the gap's not big enough and therefore that doesn't make it a very compelling thing for an organization to have to go through invest in all their time all their money when the actual outcome is not very different when they are now where you really see something is where you understand the technology enough to go well hold on there's a really big gap between current mode and f potential future state look at all the benefits this is going to deliver your organization then ultimately it justifies the investment whatever the investment is ideally if that's what you want to get to that's what it's going to cost you know and hopefully by being that sherpa in the middle that can kind of help that person navigate through the technology and then build the business case and work with them that's where you get the best outcomes for all concerned so technical is very important but it's definitely not as, as important as the business acumen that someone needs right yeah there's a book title, a book title. Uh, Sherpa Selling. <laughs> Sherpa Selling. That's it. Got Sal Sherpas 101. And to be honest with you, um, I think that's just such a great analogy. I wish I wish I could say I came up with it myself. I didn't. But um, I certainly think that you need to understand where you are in terms of the higher ground, the middle ground. Help your organ, help your business. Sometimes the challenge, guys, is just do do people. Is there, a, is there sales first people who've just had an experience or an association with salespeople to not be what I would perceive a good salesperson is in 2021, which is someone who wants to help people help navigate 
through the very kind of difficult way, way um, waters of making the right decision for their business, whether it be me or anyone else. So when people think they're just, you know, there's some barrier up there, then sometimes people are, are not willing to even lay down their guards in order to create some real trust in a relationship. And you can only be genuine. And and the thing is, in, in this kind of scenario, you just try and fall back on your reputation. That's the bit. If you've got a good reputation, you've built things up, you've helped people before, you're like, look, I could say this, but just here's some of the people that I've worked with, and this is what they said about what I've done for them. So, you know, you'd hope that that was some advantage anyway. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what do you see um, as the things that you were strong at and the things that you would like, you wish you were better at? Good question. Um, I think I'm pretty strong in the uh, with a customer. Just human interactions are the most interesting part of everyone's life, right? Certainly the most interesting part of sales. I think what I've managed to develop over the years is no no distance really between me as I am with my friends and my family to me as I am with my customers and potential clients as well. So there's no pretense there. Um, so I can just be myself quite freely and talk and converse in a way that's not manufactured. Hope doesn't feel manufactured in any way. And it's just genuine and, and from the heart. So I think that's probably good. What, not what you see is what you get. But yeah, I just I just think that, that kind of comes through. I'm, I w- want to help people if I can. And... Um, I think that's so that's what I'm good at. Uh, also, like it helps with the interactions in some negotiation presentations, you know, stakeholder building, going across the organisation, you know, d- dealing with the COO or dealing with the IT infrastructure manager. I can kind of do both. That's probably where I'm where I'm pretty good. I'd say uh, that's obviously that's the that's the easy bit. The hard bit. God, so much. I wish I was better at so much. Um, there's, there's nothing really that couldn't do with a little bit of um, uh, uh, refinement or a lot of refinement. I think some of my creative writing is pretty good, but it takes me a long time. I have to write a lot of bids. I have to write a lot of exec summaries. That seems to take me a lot longer than I'd like. Even they, they seem to be okay, I think. I think I have a tendency to overcomplicate, certainly in scenarios where I don't. It's out slightly out of my comfort zone. So I may try and overcome. Again, these are things that certainly are, are, are afflictions earlier. In my um, and I think that, you know, on a, on a com- commercials perspective, I work with some people who are just amazing at all of it. You know, some people I can name who are just maybe not so good at the people stuff that I was, but in terms of putting together really complex business models, negotiating very complex terms, being so well-rounded, and all of those other disciplines that I was just in awe of them, right? They're still friends of mine today. So I can take a little bit from everyone and I can just see where people are a lot stronger than me in everyone. It, junior to me, senior to me, uh, there's, there's something in everyone that you can learn from, right? And improve. Uh, if, I, if I was here to say, what could I be better on? God, we'd be here for another two hours. <laughs> okay. Um, so... Um, what do you consider to be the character traits and qualities that are important factors in success? Good question again. Um, I think uh, I think a dedication to self development, I really think is is really key. Um, I think you know, the world's a big classroom, right? And I think you you can learn from every scenario and everyone that you speak with. So if you're curious enough, so curiosity is the main one. But I mean, if you're curious enough to want to learn and pursue excellence in what you do, then I think that's a, you know, I think that someone who has that mindset are often the most successful. People who don't rest on their laurels and have that emotional resilience that's required in sales to be able to get up the next day, get out of bed the hundredth day in a row at 6 a.m., start work again and and to keep going there. So you, you certainly need that, mental you know mental fortitude and commitment to self-development i would say are the ones that are really there as well and and i think anyone who's open to 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 criticism um, and open to constructive criticism of what they do 
where I find it's very difficult. You, you, do, you don't really find a lot of salespeople who are willing to do stuff like, you know, internal workshops and role plays with their peers because we're also worried about, you know, how that might affect our egos. We're quite egocentric salespeople. And, you know, so I think that, I think that if you can kind of leave that at the door a little bit and leave yourself completely open to just accept you're going to make mistakes and no one's perfect. I do believe there is a culture within sales of like looking down on someone who makes a mistake. And there isn't really been that, not necessarily my organization, but just from what I see across the industries over many years. Um, I think what, what, if that can be kind of eradicated, then I think you're going to get a lot more successes and people being able to flourish in what they do. That answer your question? Absolutely, it does. Yes. Uh, and I, I like you, I could talk about it for hours too, but this is all to get your thoughts and feelings out. So I'm going yeah. to resist the temptation. Uh, that, is, that did answer the question very well indeed. So um, let's, uh, uh, if you had to distill all this into one piece of advice for a newcomer, um, what would it be? It's quite uh, I mean, it's a really simple answer to that. So if anyone's starting off in sales and asks me, you know, what can I say? What can I do to help them? I'd, be ask, I'd ask them what they're reading. It's really as simple as that. Uh, what are you reading? Okay. All right, well, you need to read this. Then you need to read that. And the more that I think, you know, knowledge is, is, is absolutely key in the build out of one's own kind of personality. And, you know, when, when I speak to people who are in their, you know, early 20s, early in their career so young you know i thought it was such high stakes like that and it really didn't it really wasn't and i really didn't have any perspective or any guide to like to be able to put things into perspective but the more that you read and the more that you understand psychology or the psychology of sales psychology in itself you know self-actualization personal development then what you can do is you once you gain that you can ride the rocky road of sales and put things into perspective I would love to think, I mean, what's used if it's not wasted, but I'd love to think if I was starting to sell in sales now, it'd be very different than when I started when I was 17. And it was like, there's a phone book, there's a telephone, go on and do it. And I, yeah, I hate it, I hate it, I absolutely hated everything. Now there's so much available to someone who really wants to make this a career that you could, there's a lot of theory there, but you start to bring it and breathe it into your world. And I just think that's so good. So that's, if anyone said to me, what advice can you give me? I'd be like, what are you reading? And my advice would be that maybe the next book for them to pick up. That's excellent. That is absolutely extraordinarily valuable advice. And I'd Thanks. just like to underline it with a quote, which is um, uh, from Sir, I Sir Isaac Newton, of his very famous scientist, as hopefully everybody's heard of him. And, it, and it, it was, if I've seen further than other men, it is because I stand on the shoulders of giants. Right? Absolutely. And, and that's absolutely. Uh, it's, there's uh, there's, a, there's an incredible amount of, of, of resource out there to people who are you know wanting to get where they want to get to in sales uh, but the, the key to that is, the, the key to that for us, anyone else joining after what they're reading is like get themselves a mentor get someone who actually cares about their development and will be you know i'm always very happy i'm into quite a few people i'm very happy to do it um I, I mean, and you know who knows what might become a bit of it as well but no yeah uh, this as i say you and i could probably talk for ages on these on these points right most definitely yeah but we, we've we've used up 45 minutes so uh i think we, we probably better draw this to a close and uh so i mean this has been, this has been wonderful and i'm, I'm sure it's going to get a lot of views um and uh I'll, i will of course share it to you with you before i publish it but uh thanks for coming on this and thanks for being interviewed and kerry i look forward to talking to you again in the future um, thanks clive yeah i really enjoyed it thanks a lot you too